Hey everybody, welcome back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. You'll notice that I'm not, I'm not Sean Finder, and there's no Sean with me today. That's because sometimes there's a little bit too much of Sean going around on this podcast. So what we're going to do today is we're going to relive one of his uh, really good keynote sessions that he did at an event we made a few months ago. It was called Growth Month, and uh, really what I said to him is, "Hey Sean, there's a really great story that you have about how you built and founded Order Close and, and led it to acquisition." Just tell that story. That's all I want. Just literally come on, just, you know, reminisce and take us back. Tell us what happened and how you did it. So that's what he did. And uh, it's about 20 minutes or so. I'll say no more than that. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy this session. A lot of cool things behind the scenes that maybe you didn't know if you haven't been following us for too long. Or maybe if you, even if you had, you might not have just heard about it anyways. So with that, enjoy Sean's talk. I'm very excited to do my session here with you guys. My name is Sean Finder, um, former CEO of AutoClose. We were acquired by VanillaSoft in October 2020. So I have a lot to discuss with you today. and I'm really looking forward to sharing a lot of uh, my stories, um, some good ones and some bad ones. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is um, AutoClose. We're going to talk about how I came up with the idea, um, how it started, um, how it even started before AutoClose. We're going to talk about some cold emails, um, SDRs, um, when we decided to bring on SDRs, what those SDRs did, how that looked like. Um, we'll talk about LinkedIn. Um, and I'm also going to try and give you guys some stories on uh, on some of the, uh, the good and the bad and even some of the ugly um, that happened along this crazy journey as an entrepreneur. So um, to start, I'm going to talk about AutoClose. Um, so how AutoClose became a thing was um, in 2014, I started Exchange Leads, which was a company. And the reason why I started Exchange Leads was um, I was a big fan of, if you can remember the old Jigsaw. Um, Jim Fowler started that. He It was acquired by Salesforce, then renamed as data.com. Um, I really love that kind of crowdsourced model. So I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to try and do something very similar. So we came up with Exchange Leads, which was the exact same model as Jigsaw. You could upload contacts. um, We'll give you credits. Use those credits to download new contacts. So as you got more credits, we shared our volume of credits inside our database continued to grow and grow. But what happened was, you know, we came up with that idea and we we didn't hit really a roadblock. We were growing it, um, but we felt like we were all about the data. And then people would come to us for the data and be like, okay, well, you gave me the data, but like, what do I do with it? Where do I email it? So we uh, we we started like, you know, well, you should use MailChimp. You should use this company. You could use Outreach. You could use SalesOff. You could use Growbots. You can use all these different companies. And then it came to me. It was like, at some point, it was like, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting the data. We have all these clients on here. At some point, maybe we should pivot and kind of get something else under our umbrella. So what really happened there was um, – if you live in Canada, you'll you'll understand. Um, we ended up going in. I am cold calling and getting in with uh, Rogers Communications. If you don't know Rogers, it's like the Verizon or AT and T out in the U.S. One of the top five largest companies here in Canada. And what happened was, I went in. I told them about the data. I told them what we can do. And they were like, "Well, how many people are on your team?" And at that point, there was only three. And I said, "Oh, we have a thirty-two person team, um, all ready to do. We've been around." Because I needed them to trust me. So what actually happened was um, I went in there telling them I had 32 people. We only had three. Um, and let, let's just say six weeks later, I had a huge six-figure PO. Big PO. I looked at my partner. And I'm like, oh, we need to get people because they think we have 32 people working on this project and we only have three. So what happened? Um, we started recruiting. And as we were recruiting, we started to work on their data project, which was a year-long project. It was a six-figure project. So what happened was we were built very lean. A lot of our um, contractors were out of Eastern Europe, Serbia to be exact. And um, we had, at this point, a PO, money paid up front, money in the bank. And I was like, well, we have a lot of money in the bank. We can either hire more people or let's keep developing. So what happened? I said, well, we have the data. Why don't we develop something that will actually be around the email? So an email engagement, a sales engagement, something similar to what Sales Loft and Outreach had, but at a very smaller scale. Hmm. So what do we do? 
Uh, I met developers out in New York, flew out to New York, had them build out a prototype, and auto close was started. So what did I do? I took instead of taking the money and the profits from that six figure PO that we got within the first few months of of exchange leads, I reinvested that money to build auto close. And so every cent I made there went right into auto close. So we had the developers building it. And I was like, okay, well, we can't really start from scratch. Like, you know, we now hired a lot of people. We have a full-time team. I've been, you know, I, I quit my, my day job. Um, we need to start growing. So what did we do? Um, one of the strategic things I did was um, I ended up building and having our team build out a landing page. And I felt it was very important for people to feel like they built auto close with me. So all those early adopters of exchange leads, I was saying to myself, okay, I want them to feel that they were part of this. So when I actually launched this thing, they're really into it. So what did I do? Six months leading up to our launch date. So let's just use, I think our launch date was January. So I started about in July. We had a landing page built. And every week I would send our prospects, our email newsletter, everybody, a video of our building of auto clothes. So imagine you have a you know a condo, a house. You built that foundation. I was showing them how we built every single layer, every window, every door, every doorknob, the kitchen, the marble, the granite, whatever, the ceramic, whatever you want, the roof, everything. So what happened was leading up to that launch day, when we hit January, or I think it was De- December, January, I had a huge list of people that felt like they were already invested in our company. Just because I made them feel like they were part of the big launch we're doing. So this is where it got interesting. Um, We ended up having our launch day. Three people in a boardroom in downtown Toronto. I remember renting out the boardroom. And we sent out a calendar, a Calendly to be exact. And I was like, okay, we'll send out the Calendly. We'll get some demos, etc. Let alone, I think we had over 400 demos booked. And at this point, I had three people, but two were salespeople. One was an introvert. My partner is a little bit of introvert um, who probably didn't want to go on and do demos. There's two of us. I was like, what am I going to do? Like we got 400 demos booked and we have people thinking we're a massive company, but there's only three of us. So what do I do? I start calling all my friends down here on Bay Street. It's like the Wall Street of the U.S., Bay Street. They're all in finance. I'm like, I need I needed guys that can just learn the product quick, smart people, come on, help me out, and I'll pay you. I taught them the product. I did a presentation in the boardroom. This is how AutoClose is going to look. This is how it is. I need you guys all to do demos. So what I do, have these people all doing demos for me for the first three months we, as we did demos for the 400 people. So we started getting revenue right away. Um, people ask, when were you break even? Um, I would say we were, uh, development was about a hundred, I think it was about 100, over a hundred thousand dollars in development of the first MVP of auto close. We were break even within 90 days. So we broke even very quick because of all the traction we had early on. So we imagine we have three people in a boardroom. We, um, we get that whale client, that Rogers, um, I have to find friends. And then what did we keep doing? We keep putting money back into the business. Every cent, I took no salary, every cent that we made back in. And what happened was literally every month we would hire one or two more people. It might be in Serbia, it might be all over Europe. We had some people in North America and we kept growing the company. So we invest, we kept reinvesting. We had to reinvest. So we took, we took all the clothes, we reinvested. Um, and by the time, so this was in 2017, by the time it was October, 2020, the time of our acquisition to Vanilla Soft, um, we were over thirty people, and doing um, you know north of north of seven figures. So all bootstrapped, never raised a cent. Um, so that was kind of the story how we went from you know the, the exchange leads, just so you know, um, to pivot a little bit to that data and email all in one bundle, um, flying out to New York to get the uh, the developers having a big launch. Um, and one thing I want to mention actually about the biggest thing with articles, this is advice I got from David Cancel. I tell everyone this, um, he's the CEO of Drift, was I asked him at a conference here at SalesTO in Toronto. 
I'm about to launch a business. What do I charge? Do we give a free trial for 14 days? And the best advice I got, so if you're, you're here at this session, the best advice I got was charge them anything. So what did I do? I go, like, David, what do you mean? He goes, get on the phone and say, this is my demo. How much are you willing to spend on a monthly package for this? Month to month. 20 bucks. It's yours. Five bucks. Yours. Two bucks. Yours. 30 bucks. Yours. So the first 50 people, whatever price they mentioned, I actually gave it to them. I didn't set the price. And then we started to slowly see where we had that kind of that stickiness in the pricing. One of the best advice I ever got was make them involved, make them feel involved, and then have them pay something. I don't care if it's a dollar a month, have them pay something instead of giving it for free. So the second section I want to kind of talk about today, and it's one I'm very passionate about, is, is cold emails. You know, cold emails have changed over time. I remember when I started, you know, cold emails were, um, everyone was cold emailing, but you can just cold email and you can get results. You have to be strategic now in your cold emails. So you can't just um, send a cold email and expect, you know, better deliverability rate, open rates, et cetera. The key is a few things. One, personalization. You need to be personalizing your cold emails. You need to find a nugget, an interest. There's tons of places to find it. LinkedIn, you can go on and find interest if you want. You have to find those nuggets and use them in your cold email. Find an interest. I always tell people this. If you're listening to this and you want to cold email me, put something about tennis. I played competitive tennis. You put that in the subject line. You put that in the first three seconds of your cold email. I probably will reply to you. So if you're looking at this and you want to pitch me something, Talk about tennis, I will reply. If you don't talk about tennis, I rarely reply. Because I know you've done your research and you've seen online that I used to play competitive tennis. Um, you want to try and stick out to the crowd, so being personal, stick out to the crowd. But you, you want to make sure that you also involve multiple channels inside your emails. So you can't nowadays just rely on emails. Email is just one channel. You have phone, you have SMS, you have LinkedIn, you have you know, Twitter, TikTok, all these different channels out there. You got to do a combination of two to three channels to be successful. If you're going to rely just on email, you're probably not. But if you rely on the email and then you add them as a LinkedIn connection, you comment on their LinkedIn, you build a conversation with them or, um, you know, get in a debate with them on one of their posts, you're more likely to get them to reply. So um, one thing you guys will notice about you know, you know, COVID, I don't think we're ever getting out of it, but over the last two years, cold emails become hotter. Um, a lot of people are working from home. I'm doing this from my basement right now. You know, this is my office. Um, so a lot of people are working from home. Um, they're not working in the office like they used to. So cold emails become a very important channel. Not to say that phone is not a, a, a big channel. Cold, cold calling is still very important. I think LinkedIn is probably the most important um, just because you know, you can do it at scale. You can get personal. You can get involved in conversations. Um, as long as you're not just spamming people on LinkedIn, I think it's a very important channel that you need to combine into your phone, your SMS, or your email. And that's the cool thing about VanillaSoft is you have all those different channels that you can actually use um, inside your sequence. So the biggest thing I would take from this is you 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 need to stop thinking that one of those channels is going to work for you. You have to know that at least you're going to have to be involved in one, two, maybe even three of those channels to be very successful. So what I want you really to do with cold email is A, keep it personable. Two, get a nugget, an interest. Understand that email is hot right now. Cold emails are working. People are replying. People are opening them. And four, the most important is have multiple channels. So don't just rely on the one, the two, rely on more than one channel. So as we continue on with this session, I want to jump in, you know, with three more kind of little, little titles I want to talk about. SDRs is the next one. People always ask me, like, when do you hire an SDR? So I find that people sometimes try and grow too quickly, meaning if you can't say to yourself that you can fill your SDR's calendar with, you know, four to five hours a day of, um, of you know prospecting, um, cold calling, and you don't have a schedule for them, you don't have a plan for them, don't hire them yet. 
well, the biggest me we made as mistake is um, is I hired SDRs but didn't have a plan, didn't have a script, didn't have a playbook. So important. As an SDR, they have to go in and they have to learn the product for a week. They have to learn the script for a week. They have to learn the LinkedIn tools, all the sales stack. So there, you need to be organized and ready to hire the SDRs. What we did was we had one SDR for two AEs, and then we ended up hiring a second SDR, a third SDR. <laughs> but at some point, we had so many SDRs, we need to start hiring our CSM, which were a pivotal part of our business. Upselling now, now I would say probably comes about 30, 40% of our business upselling our existing clients with all the new revenue driving features. So, um, But I would say SDR is very important. Uh, we hired our first SDR after about eight months, simply because our AEs were so busy closing deals um, and, and doing demos. Um, but when you get to a point where you need people to start prospecting, and we went through those 400 demos and people were interested, et cetera, at that point is when we actually got involved with their SDRs. Um, and you got to invest in your SDRs. I will tell you, um, looking back now, one of my first SDRs is, um, is now an AE. And he has been extremely um, successful with his professional development. So when you're hiring that SDR, make sure you can map out that one, three, five-year plan for those SDRs. Um, no one wants to stay stagnant. They want to continue to grow as a professional. And this is how you do it, is map out their plan. We want you as an SDR for a year. Then you're going to go into customer success to learn exactly how our clients work. Then you're going to go into this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but training, um, and getting them everything they need is probably the most important thing. So you're not ready for an SDR if you don't have a playbook, you don't have a script ready, but if you do, I think you could be ready for that next step, which is to bring that SDR on. The next section I want to talk about is LinkedIn. Um, what an amazing tool. I like to call it the intangible touch. And I've done a podcast uh, on the Inside Sales podcast about this. I've done many podcasts. I'm talking about the intangible touch. You can do things on LinkedIn without actually calling or sending an email to a person. You could like, endorse, comment, uh, share. And what's going to happen is on your newsfeed, inside your LinkedIn, it's going to say, Sean Finder like this. Sean Finder comment on this. Sean Finder did this. When you're going to send that email or call, be like, oh, Sean Finder. Where have I heard that name from? Oh, oh yeah, you. Uh, we we're talking on LinkedIn. So you want to use the intangible touches on LinkedIn. Very important. Navigator for searching. Um, there's a lot of uh, LinkedIn automation tools. I'm not so fond of them because I like the personalization, but you can use them to really filter the industry and who you're looking after. If you're going the ABM route um, and you just signed on for me, Rogers Communication. What did I do? The first thing I signed them on Telus, Bell, those are the other two. So like Verizon, you know, AT&T, Warner, whatever it might be. Um, you want to, I call it circle and map that client. So if a client signs up, you want to take that on the map, school, whatever they are, and map around it and find out who are the 10 people that are closest to that company. If they can benefit, who potentially would have FOMO, the fear of missing out? Can I go after them? Okay, so use LinkedIn to get those people, find out who those industries are, um, et cetera. Um, get involved in debates on LinkedIn. Um, I know a lot of people that just you know comment on my post just to strike a conversation with me. Um, that's a good way of doing it. LinkedIn has a lot of different things you can use. And I recommend if you're listening, you put aside one hour a day on your calendar and you call it social selling hour. Because that's what I used to do. It used to be social selling hour. Every day for one hour, I would make sure I did a few posts. I would do a few comments. I would do a few endorsements and all that stuff. You want to know why? Because the algorithm will work in your favor. The more time you're on LinkedIn, the more time you're doing things on LinkedIn, the more LinkedIn is going to actually show your face on, on your prospects' walls and news feeds. So it's very important that you use LinkedIn properly. Now, don't go and just spam on LinkedIn. Use it to actually get in touch with the right people. You know, if you're looking for a CMO, reach out to the director of marketing on LinkedIn to get, to get that referral to that CMO. So two different strategies you can use. Um, so, you know, talking about some stories, uh, I always like to tell stories when I'm doing these presentations. Um, early on, there was a story I remember, uh, it was a 
tough story was uh, one of the biggest uh, things we had with with um, exchange leads was early on. We had a client sign on um, and buy thirty thousand dollars worth of data. Love the data. We sent it to him. He he uh, he used PayPal um, to uh, to pay us, and then he charged us back. Even though he loved the data, he got results because it was PayPal. He charged us back. So if you're listening and you're a startup, one of the biggest mistakes we made was not doing wire transfers on anything over five thousand dollars. Um, that thirty thousand, we ended up having to pay back just simply because. Actually, no, PayPal actually gave us the money, but we had to fight for about three months um, as he tried to get his money back. So, um, one of the stories was that. The other story was um, I love to say this one was one of my ways I got into um, into DHL. Uh, so DHL was um, a company we wanted to target because at that point I think we were working with. FedEx here in Canada for our data, and we want to get into DHL Canada. So what did I do? I'm not recommending anyone do this because some people think it's it's a it's a good tactic. Some did not like it, but I'm the type of salesperson to do. You got to do what you can, you got to do to get in. Um, I couldn't get in touch with anybody, so I actually called the CEO. And to get the CEO, you had to go through an admin person. Um, and just like you guys have the the IRS in the US, we have the CRA here in Canada, Can you, Canada Revenue Agency. I called uh, the assistant answered and goes, how, you know, I'd like to speak to, you know, Bob, the CEO, like, well, he's not taking calls. You know, can I take your name and number? I'm like, well, it's a CRA calling. I have, I need five minutes of his time. She's like, oh, so when they hear IRS or CRA, she's like, oh, okay. Gives me the, um, the CEO of DHL. And he goes, I'm like, honestly, I'm not the CRA, but this was the only way I'd get five minutes of time to find out who I need to speak to. He goes, I respect the hustle. You have two minutes, go. So I had to give him the two-minute pitch. He ended up introducing me to the director of marketing. It was very high up um, at DHL. And that is how I got DHL as an account, which was our second largest account. So Rogers was our largest. DHL was uh, another large one. Um, so just to say that you can be a little bit strategic in how you get accounts. Um, some people think that you shouldn't lie like I lied. But um, as I said, I'm the type of person that really – Almost does whatever it takes to get the sale. Um, and and I think the one lesson that I'd love to leave everyone here with that isn't sales is you have to remember, as a salesperson, your job is to be persistent. Um, not annoying, but persistent. So if you're not in between persistent and annoying, you're not doing well in sales. You have to you have to be in that fine line, but you have to be persistent um, and almost annoying. So, um, you know, I hope that was a lot. Uh, I know, you know, I want to give you guys a little bit of history on the auto close, some of my mistakes, some of my tips on hiring SDRs, LinkedIn, using that as a, as did definitely a channel and a tactic, and obviously sharing some cold email um, um, strategies on where we're going with cold email. So, um, you know, I wanted to thank everybody here for watching my sh session. Uh, make sure you uh, you check out the agenda. We have a lot of great sessions in this uh, little conference um, and bookmark them so you don't miss the next session. Once again, my name is Sean Finder. Thanks for joining me today. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at Sean, S-H-A-W-N at autoclose.com or even better, come find me on LinkedIn or cold email me about tennis. Thanks again. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the, uh, the event. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this far. If you managed to make it along as far as you have, uh, I really enjoyed that one from Sean. It's nice to know some of the things that happen behind the scenes uh, as you know, public facing people like marketers and salespeople, we don't always tell you absolutely everything. And I think it's nice to hear some of these you know, kind of insider story sometimes and plenty more where this came from. Believe me, we've got lots more of this stuff to come. So if you did enjoy that, please make sure you subscribe down below, leave a comment, leave a like. And remember, we publish this once a week. It's on all of the normal places like Spotify and Apple Podcasts, A, B, and C. But we also put this on LinkedIn live every Tuesday. So wherever you want to follow, wherever you want to find the stuff, we're putting it there. Make sure you follow on that channel that you choose and we'll see you next time.